All right. Hello, everybody. Um, my name's Anthony, and today I'm interviewing Phil Elfram, the person behind the microphones in Mount Erie. And how are you doing today, Phil? I'm good. How are you? I'm doing great. I know that you just finished, you know, wrapping up the last two of the microphones in 2020. I'm assuming the 14th in Texas was your last show? Yeah, that's right. Oh, so how was, you know, touring, you know, you know, since COVID started and I guess just being back on the road and, you know, just touring this one album. It was really fun. It was really fun to get to play that long song live. So it was pretty unusual um, for me, at least. I, I'm used to playing lots of songs with breaks in between and clapping and, you know, talking. But yeah. this one, it was different. I guess some artists, in, in Austin, actually, we would, we saw, um, like, Grouper played and then other people we saw play these sets that were more like long one long piece and I was like oh okay that's actually pretty normal people do that all the time especially maybe in the classical or ambient worlds but yeah for me it was a new experience to do that type of show mm. uh were there any like I guess memorable moments at a single show or anything like you would like to I guess talk about yeah y yeah <laughs> don't guess. worry if you don't really have any uh, well that's kind of too broad of a question it's every show had memorable moments and so it's hard to pull one out of the air but yeah it's each time is different and try and make it kind of weird and unusual each time hmm. um so i guess one of the things i wanted to talk about is just how like i guess in this past two years it's kind of this i guess shift from you know, Mount Erie and everything. And I know names don't mean that much to you as you always kind of say in your interviews that it's just another progression in your artistic career. And I guess, d did it ever feel like kind of a little different this time, you know, like with the whole pandemic and, you know, capstoning your, you know, career as the microphones, I guess, under that name. And just like wrapping that up with the box set tour, this last installment in that discography. You're asking if it felt different? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but not because of the name thing or because of the band name designation. It felt different just because we were doing this one song, playing it, doing a tour where we actually only knew one song and just only played that each night. And it was, it's a lot of words to remember. And yeah, it was just unusual in all ways. It felt, yeah. felt different. But, but to be fair, every tour feels different. Was it, I, I guess, exciting? Were you like just like pumped to be like, yeah, I'm ready to do this one long song? Yeah. For people. yeah. Totally. And also, I hadn't been on tour in a long time because of the pandemic. And actually, that tour had been set up and canceled once or maybe twice. Like it, you know, we kept trying to schedule it and then it fell through because of COVID. So, yeah, it was really exciting. I love touring still. So, yeah, I mean, I, I know from looking at like things like when you started touring back in the early 90s and everything, you were just kind of, I, I guess, really into the idea of like, you know, sharing that music and that experience. And like, I've been looking at all those, like, I looked at that documentary, the wise old little boy documentary and just how like, I guess, very fun it was and just like, I guess, bouncy and everything. Do you like, would you like to do that stuff again? like, you know, in that type of form and more intimate setting? Or do you think it's just kind of hard to move past that since that was in your like 20s and now you're, you know, later in your career? No, no, it still feels that way to me, even though I guess, yeah, the, the venues are bigger than living rooms like they were back then. But I always assume that uh, inevitably this, the venues will get small again, like fewer people will be interested and I'll, I'm not going to stop. So however many people want to show up if it's only five then that's fine i'll just play in a small place but lately yeah they've been bigger rooms i i, I like it both ways i guess actually mm -hmm. i like it a little more playing in the small places playing in like basements and stuff because it just feels more immediate and like alive yeah and more of a, a yeah more intimate more of a close interaction between the people watching the show but yeah, playing these bigger spaces because 
I can tour less. I, I used to be able to just always be on tour. And so it was no big deal to play. Like, this is getting technical, but like, if I was going to play in Portland and a hundred people wanted to come to the show, but I had three days to do it, I would play like three different basements across Portland, for example, with 30 something people at each show. Does that make sense? But now yeah. I only have one day to spend in Portland. So I have to play at a hundred person size place because I have mm -hmm. to be more rushed because I'm a parent and um, there's like, my daughter goes to school. And so tours can't be like this forever thing. Yeah. Concentrated. Mm. Well, when you were starting out, I guess, you know, as like the microphones are the on you, like your early 20s, is it ever like, do you still feel the same about like that immediacy and that intimacy? Or like, were you always like when you were younger, you wanted something bigger than that? No, I, I wasn't ever really focused on getting big or anything like that. It was more just about um, making something that felt right to me that felt like alive and important to me and then sharing it with people with whoever was interested but it wasn't I never was really compelled to like force myself on people or like hype myself up and be like you know I need your attention give give me your attention because I'm important and it was never like that did I guess when you were just uh like again like when you're starting off early did you like, uh, like you didn't really, like you said, you didn't really have the inspiration, to, like the aspiration to get big or like, get, like rock star famous or anything like that. Like, um, did you ever see like an angle, like maybe like, I guess, continuing making the stuff that makes that, like that makes you feel satisfactory, but do you think you can do that? Like, is that the one thing you truly want to do for the rest of your life? Yeah, it does feel like um, something I want to figure out how to sustain forever is to have time in my life to be able to make art um and the fact that right now enough people are interested that i'm like getting some money from the art that i do is really sweet because a lot, it gives me the time that i can spend more time doing those things but um even if no one cared and the money stopped coming i would still be doing those things i would probably just also have to spend some of my time working at a job to survive but yeah it's, yeah it's never never thought about it as a job really i guess just one of the things i like speaking of your art and like i know that you're into film and like other forms of media i guess just one thing i haven't seen that has been spoken from like what i know is like i guess you're just your india ink drawings and everything like i have never seen this like ever anywhere and i just think this is like insane how you create these huge like landscapes and i know that i think it was like in high school you had this giant bottle of India ink or something and then you just started doing that like what inspires you to draw all this and like like this is like out of this world to me but I don't know for you if that was like I don't know like oh I see it everywhere else in where you were from do you mean why those particular drawings or why do drawings at all I guess particular drawings because I see it throughout your work you have like a certain style I don't know if you would agree with that or not but you just have this sure. certain thing that just is recognizable and like mm -hmm. like the floating head well I know that's Kyle Field but like that type of just aesthetic I guess yeah sure I don't know yeah I I the India ink thing it uh when I found that bottle of India ink in high school it really changed things for me because I had always done art and like you know been an art kid but finding that ink it, it was like so powerful the feeling of dipping a brush into like black black ink and putting it on white paper and how how stark that was it wasn't watery at all it wasn't like translucent or anything it was just like black on white and I hadn't so basic it's like using a marker I, I was into sharpies before but it just had no they the line wasn't alive. So like a brush in like a lot of black ink, like Asian calligraphy, it's just a powerful, stark, living line. And so I've never really moved beyond that. I, I always think like someday I'm gonna get into using color in my art, but I haven't gotten there yet. I still feel like black and white and then like sometimes the wash of gray. 
that's that's a lot of stuff to explore still yeah because i just look at these and like it's like i said it's like it's bonkers to me how like huge like how much you just drew with just like black and white it's like incredible to me and i guess other mediums like your photography i find really amazing and just you know even though for like, like some people it just looks like regular just pictures of like a landscape or something you there's something about that the way that you take it just feels a bit more personal like amateurish if sorry if that's offensive or anything like that but yeah, no. i i just love that quality of it and i i know that you still have like a film camera if that's true yeah. do you still take those photos of yourself like running over like over to the camera standing there for a minute coming back to have those like um i guess long exposure photos sometimes yeah this is the camera here that all those pictures are from i still i still do that sometimes yeah have you ever like uh i guess been in a public situation where you just stand and people are just like why is he standing there for so long sure but usually usually i end up taking pictures when no one's around or when it's like very dark out and that's that type of that technique only really works when it's really dark because if mm -hmm. you open up the lens for that long and it's full daylight, um, it would get flooded and overexposed really quick. So yeah, it's like a nighttime technique. And usually at night, people are home. One thing that's kind of been like scratching the back of my head ever since I was like thinking about you and your time in Olympia in your early 20s is like, how did like your parents feel about that? Just like living kind of like this indie like dream or whatever, like. They were always really supportive and I wasn't like living in any dangerous situations or anything. I, I you know, I had a house and um, I worked a job occasionally and I had enough money for food and rent. So yeah, I have, I have supportive parents. Even when I decided to stop going to college, they were like, okay, makes sense for you. See, we see that you're doing stuff that is, uh, that you're passionate about, so. Yeah. Are they like taking a look at your, like, I guess, over the years and be like, whoa, like, have they ever changed that perception of you, like, being this artist out and about, or, or do they still see you as like, oh, he's just interested in art? <laughs> yeah, no, I think that they, they're not, they're not super um, forthcoming with compliments, but no, they, they give me compliments. <laughs> they, I think that they like see what I do with my life and um, appreciate it. It's, yeah, it's good. We have a good relationship. Yeah, they're they're really supportive and great, great people. Wonderful. There's no like um, belittling or anything of choices I've made. They, they're artists too, pretty much, even though they haven't pursued it in like a serious professional way. They both have like a artistic, way of approaching life so yeah it's, i'm not a weirdo to them oh. <laughs> but i don't know if this is a, i guess too personal a question but like has your have you ever like i don't know showed your daughter like what do you like what she thinks about this entire like art thing is it normal to her that you go oh, yeah of course she's yeah she's been on tour she's she's in it she's she lives this life also she goes on tour with me. She, she doesn't go to the shows usually. She's been to a few, but usually she's like at the sound checks. She gets to sing in the microphone and hear her voice echo big. And she's planning to be a, a pop star. And <laughs> she, yeah, she's super artistic and musical. Also, it's normal for her. Do you think the you know your I guess your artist you just bounce off to her and she'll probably be like I don't know the next. Um, smashing pumpkins or something i think she's at the moment at least more geared towards like miley cyrus oh, okay yeah she's she's really into big marquee pop star um i had just played her we've been playing exploring a lot, like every day we drive to school and listen to new pop music the other day we were listening to um 100 gex a lot and she's kind of into it She's like, it's a little too crazy for me, but I'm into it. I, I saw you tweet about it. Like, Hunter Gex used to go on a, a tour with Neil Young and Crazy Horse. And I was like, that that would be awesome. Wouldn't it? 
Yeah, that would be crazy, honestly. Like, I already love Neil Young, but 100 Gex, like, you just hear, like, bass-boosted music, and just, like, that would be crazy. Yeah, I think that they're both extreme. Well, also, yeah, the other day at the farmer's market here in this, like, little hippie place where I live, there was a band of old people playing acoustic music, you know, in the middle of the day at the farmer's market. I thought that would also be a really good tour companion for 100 Gex, just because it's almost like the opposite energy, just very slow, kind of... Like, just the juxtaposition between... Yeah, like, exactly. I, guess... I, I always want that in a show. I don't like shows where it's more a bunch of the same thing so that would be more interesting to me do you have someone that you would like to like bring along to juxtapose this like be like be the opposite of you i would love to tour with 100 gex i i as if i was opening for them i feel like it would be so terrifying actually their fans are probably um would probably not take very well to me playing guitar and singing but i would like that challenge <laughs> I, I can honestly see them like moshing to like when you drop the bass in like the microphones in 2020, they're just gonna start like oh, yeah, moshing maybe. all over the place. Yeah, maybe, but I would probably end up playing acoustic guitar and singing and just do like the, the most mellow show ever, just to torture myself. That would be amazing. And I would totally go see that if you ever did. When you were starting, I guess, Mount Erie in like the mid 2000s and I know, like, like I said, again, you don't really care about being, you know, the microphones kind of was like a name you only use for that period of time. It didn't feel suitable for the things that you were going to embark on. When you were making the No Flashlight record, did you feel like you had to reinvent yourself or this was just another record from you? Yeah, it felt like another record from me. I mean, I did feel like I had been reinvented just personally. My life had changed. I had like gone to Norway for a winter and then moved away from Olympia. So I'd gone through all these other cha like changes in life and it just felt like a new chapter had begun. So of course, a new, pro a new name for this art project felt appropriate. Like I was a, a different person basically. Do you think you would recommend that experience for everybody like in their mid twenties just to like go somewhere or not even somewhere, but just do something where you just live with yourself, learn about yourself? For sure, definitely. I, I think it's almost like should be mandatory. <laughs> I, it was so crucial. And in fact, I think it's probably good to do it regularly, not just once. I think that, mm -hmm. well, it's like people go on silent meditation retreats, for example, same thing. It's like the simple living a radically simplified version of life in order to sort of reset the brain. I think it's really important. Did that ever really happen when you were like traveling, like tour or not to or did, like anywhere you went did feel like you had to restart or I guess have that type of um, retreat? Not while touring. No, touring is kind of the opposite experience. It's kind of a maximal sensory overload experience where you're moving constantly and there's lots of stimulation and consumption, just eating and moving. And yeah, it's the opposite. And no, to, to schedule in Emptiness time is, uh, it requires a lot of effort. I was actually thinking of doing something like similar to that, probably not Norway, but maybe somewhere like in the countryside of like Japan or some like Italian setting or something like nice. that. Nice. Yeah, like it seems very like pastoral and domestic and kind of like reliving life, you know, like. Yeah, the thing is, it could happen anywhere. It could be in your own backyard, but it, like. It's because it's a psychological thing. It's just it's just about like devoting to simplicity. But I was lucky enough to get the chance to do it in this like remote Norwegian place. I mean, I feel like I'm kind of doing that now, honestly. Like I just finished school in Iowa, and let's just say it didn't work out as I intended to. And so like I moved back here in Arizona, and it feels like this restart, this refresh, and starting to like under like I guess live again and understand myself and everything. And I feel like that's why I guess why I asked that question because it was like personal ties, I guess. Yeah. Um, I yeah. Have you, I guess like, are you in a space where you feel like you don't really need that anymore? Or you like probably see that yourself going somewhere else with, you know, like a vacation or something? I know I, I do need that. I think, I think that you can just keep doing it. I think that people even, people who devote their whole lives to, you know, being a monk or whatever, 
you can just keep going with it. You can get even more and more simple. You can, <laughs> I don't know where the limit is. Like you uh, sort of peel away the complications, the more the better. Mm. Was it since like, I, I know that you like, this is the last microphones album. Is it like just as smooth a transition it was the first time for the microphones to Mountain Airy as this time? No, well, I don't know, I don't know. Wait, do you mean right now after yes, the yeah. last microphone show, like what I'm gonna do next? Transition? Yeah, like back no. to your Mount Erie, you know, thing. And like, does it feel as smooth as that or? I don't like, know, I'm of... sort of right in the middle of it. I, I have a couple of shows coming up in in uh, a few weeks and they're, they're under the name Mount Erie, but honestly, I don't know what I'm gonna do at them. I don't have new songs. And so I guess I'll probably learn some, relearn some older songs and uh, I don't know what's gonna happen next, honestly. I probably will call it Mount Erie because it's a pain to have to talk about band names all the time. Like I don't wanna come up with some third band name. Yeah. And, and Microphones is definitely like this old thing that's finished, so. Yeah. Yeah, it will be that. I just don't know what shape it will take. I'm not really pressuring myself to rush into any next thing. Pretty happy in life. That's good. I'm glad to hear that. <laughs> <laughs>